World War III is upon us. It has been unfolding in slow motion for years. The only question now is who will be blamed. Humans tend to view each stage of history in isolation. As a result, they rarely see the chain reactions that build over decades, until a flashpoint catches their attention. September 11, 2001 was one such flashpoint. You could make the case that this is where it all began, and there's some truth in that, but it's also an oversimplification. I mean, let's remember here, the people we are fighting today, we funded 20 years ago. U.S. National Security Advisor Brzezinski flew to Pakistan to set about rallying resistance. He wanted to arm the Mujahideen without revealing America's role. On the Afghan border near the Khyber Pass, he urged the soldiers of God to redouble their efforts. We know of their deep belief in God, and we are confident that their struggle will succeed. That land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day, because your fight will prevail, and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again, because your cause is right, and God is on your side. Of course, we all know the Dancing with the Stars version of the story. The U.S. backed the Mujahideen in response to the Soviet invasion of December 1979. You might want to run that version by Robert Gates, director of the CIA under Ronald Reagan and George Bush Sr., secretary of defense under George W. Bush and Barack Obama, long-standing member of the CFR. Because in his memoir entitled From the Shadows, he revealed that the U.S. actually began the covert operation six months prior with the express intent of drawing in the Soviets. Oops. And guess what? they still haven't learned their lesson. Speaking of Al-Qaeda, if you do a Google search for jet fuel maximum burning temperature, you'll find an article from popularmechanics.com informing you that under ideal conditions, jet fuel tops out at 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit, and that steel melts at 2,750 degrees. They go on to explain how this isn't a problem because, quote, for the towers to collapse, their steel frames didn't need to melt. Trouble is, the steel did melt. Steel, molten steel running down the channel rails, like you're in a foundry. It's this fused element of of steel, molten steel, and concrete, and all of these things all fused by the heat into one single element, and almost like a chunk of lava from Kilauea or Iceland, where they're very sharp but but breakable shards on the end here. I mean, these things are burning. At one point, I think they were about 2,800 degrees. Underground, it was still so hot that molten metal dripped down the sides of a wall from Building 6. There were fires of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit below the ground. And all of a sudden, he comes out of this little tunnel, screaming, wait till you see what I found. And he pulls in ministers and uh, officials, and there, this cross is fully extended melted together with the intense heat. The two beams were never initially part of the same structure. Heat literally melted them together. And the piece of metal that's draped over was molten metal that had literally fallen over one of the arms. Of course, little details like the laws of physics never got in the way of a good story. Oh, by the way, did you ever find anyone who could credibly explain how a third building, World Trade Center Building 7, fell straight down at 5.21 p.m. that day, though it was not hit by a plane? And did they ever explain how the BBC reported this event 26 minutes before it actually happened? Now, more on the latest building collapse in New York. You might have heard a few moments ago I was talking about the Salomon Brothers building collapsing, and indeed it has. Apparently that's only a few hundred yards away from where the World Trade Center towers were. And it seems that this was not a result of a new attack. It was because the uh, building had been weakened uh, during uh, this morning's attacks. We'll probably find out more now about that from our correspondent, Jane Stanley. Jane, what more can you tell us about the Salomon Brothers building and its collapse? 
Well, only really what you already know. Details are very, very sketchy. There's almost a sense downtown in uh, New York behind me, down by the World Trade Centers of uh, just an area completely closed off as the rescue workers try to do their job. But this isn't the first building that uh, has suffered as a result. We know that part of the Marriott Hotel next to the World Trade Center also collapsed as a result of this huge amount of falling debris from 110 floors of two, the two twin towers of the World Trade Center. As you can see behind me, the uh, Trade Center appears to be still burning. We see these huge clouds of smoke and ash, and we know that behind that there's an empty piece of what was a very familiar New York skyline, a symbol of the financial prosperity of this city. Oh, I know what you're thinking. Maybe it was green screen and shoddy editing, and we can't confirm the actual time from that clip. Or can we? Turns out there was a second clip that did show the time, 2154. Intense and long-term. Mr. Lieber, again, again, as you're talking, news is continuing to come in, as, as you can imagine. We're now being told that yet another enormous building in New York has collapsed. It is the 47-story Salman Brothers building, which was situated very close to the World Trade Center, right there in this financial capital. 2154. That's 9.54 in England, 4.54 Eastern. 26 minutes before the building actually fell. But I digress. The invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan were not motivated by the fall of the Twin Towers, nor was the evisceration of your rights and privacy that followed. To say that 9-11 was a pretext would be putting it lightly. About 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and, and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz. I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the Joint Staff who used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me and he said, sir, you got to... Come in, you gotta come in and talk to me a second. I said, well, you're too busy. He said, no, no, he says, we've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, we're going to war with Iraq, why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to Al Qaeda? He said. No, no, it's just there's nothing new that way. They just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but we've got a good military and we can take down governments. And uh, he said, I guess if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. So I came back to see him a few weeks later. And by that time, we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq, and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. The best laid plans of mice and men often go awry, but George W. Bush sure did try. Iraq and Afghanistan became quagmires, just like Cheney predicted. Do you think the U.S. or U.N. forces should have moved into Baghdad? No. Why not? Because if we'd gone to Baghdad, we would have been all alone. There wouldn't have been anybody else with us. It would have been a U.S. occupation of Iraq. None of the Arab forces that were willing to fight with us in Kuwait were willing to invade Iraq. Uh, once you got to Iraq and took it over and took down Saddam Hussein's government, then what are you going to put in its place? That's a very volatile part of the world, and, and if you take down the central government of Iraq, you can easily end up seeing pieces of Iraq fly off. Uh, part of it uh, the Syrians would like to have to the west, uh, part of eastern Iraq uh, the Iranians would like to claim fought over for eight years. In the north, you've got the Kurds, and if the Kurds spin loose and join with the Kurds in Turkey, then you've threatened the territorial integrity of Turkey. It's a, it's a quagmire if you move that far and try to take over Iraq. Obama picked up where Bush and Cheney left off by toppling Libya and funding extremists in Syria, the precursors of ISIS. They knew the weapons were ending up in the hands of jihadists since at least 2012. They knew what would come next. A Department of Defense document from 2012 shows that the U.S. government was aware that these fighters intended to form a caliphate, and that this conflict would likely lead to a proxy war with Russia and China. The Middle East was being balkanized. Every pocket of resistance broken up into bite-sized chunks. 
but it was taking too long. So Saudi Arabia invaded Yemen, and Israel did their part by repeatedly bombing the Syrian army. In 2013, when the US-backed rebels in Syria got caught using sarin gas against civilians, and the Western narrative fell apart, Russia became a diplomatic thorn in Washington's side. So like a true gambler that doesn't know when to walk away, Obama doubled down by backing a coup in Ukraine, installing a puppet government with extensive ties to the US State Department, bankrolling their ethnic cleansing campaign in the East, and blaming the entire mess on Vladimir Putin. Russian aggression, Russian aggression, Russian aggression. Because reducing Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, and Syria to rubble is about spreading democracy. But accepting the results of a peaceful referendum in Crimea, well, that's just beyond the pale. The war on the Ukrainian front continued through 2014 and into 2015. Somewhere along the way, preparations for an open conflict between the US, Russia, and China were normalized and brought from the shadows. Open threats were leveled in full view. Coverage was predictably one-sided. We've been through this before. Weapons of mass destruction, human rights violations, Russian aggression. New excuses, same goal. If you want to start a war, the unwashed masses must be convinced to send their brothers, sons, and fathers to die on the front lines. The specter of an external enemy must be etched into their collective mind through trauma, exaggeration, and repetition. History must be whitewashed, twisted, and cherry-picked down to a politicized nursery rhyme. At no point should the real motives or consequences of such an endeavor be discussed. It stands to reason that if we want to stop a war, we must reverse this pattern. Let's start with a realistic look at the consequences. The United States and Russia alone possess a total of over 15,000 nuclear warheads, each of which are 10 to 30 times more powerful than those that the US used against Japan and Hiroshima and Nagasaki. During the Soviet era, it was understood that a hot war between these two countries would inevitably lead to the use of these weapons and would therefore be an act of mass suicide. A nuclear conflict between just these two countries, using only the weapons which are slated to be active after the implementation of the START Treaty in 2018, would release over 150 million tons of debris into the atmosphere. This debris would block out the sun dropping global temperatures between 8 and 30 degrees centigrade. Agriculture would become impossible. Mass extinctions would follow. And our species would not likely be exempt. This is a mild description. We're not even touching upon the direct consequences of the blast, firestorms, and radiation poisoning, or the secondary deaths caused by exposure and disease. In this context, you might be inclined to believe that the use of these weapons would be completely off the table, that every effort would be made to reduce stockpiles, and that no new bombs would be built. Unfortunately, this is not the case. In recent years, US strategists have begun to promote the idea of limited nuclear warfare, which would be made possible by tactical nukes. The idea being that smaller weapons are more effective because they're actually usable. This isn't just talk. Under Obama, the US military developed the most expensive and most dangerous nuclear weapon ever, the B-6112. The B-6112 is a guided nuclear missile, the first of its kind, and its yield can be dialed down electronically for the desired effect. This capability has been promoted by the CFR as a means of preemptively destroying China's hardened missile silos. Apparently, the Obama administration took these recommendations to heart because Section 1063 of the NDAA of 2013 directed the U.S. Strategic Command to prepare a report assessing the capability of the U.S. military to destroy a network of tunnels in China and quote, the known hardened and deeply buried sites of foreign nations with conventional and or nuclear forces. While Russia wasn't mentioned directly here, it should be clear that they're on that list. Those promoting this new stance claim that this is merely a new form of deterrence. But this line of argumentation, even if it were sincere, is fatally flawed. A preemptive nuclear strategy, especially one discussed in public, sends a clear message to those being threatened that they themselves must strike first. And since Russia and China did not possess guided dialing yield tactical nukes, their preemptive strikes would be full scale. Of course, America's political establishment has good reason to play chicken with all of our lives and the future of the planet. The balance of geopolitical and financial power has been shifting, and not in Washington's favor. China's new Silk Road project, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and outposts in the South China Sea 
in tandem with the Eurasian Union spearheaded by Russia, are edging the United States out of the world's new center of gravity. Pivots have failed. Bilateral discussions have gotten nowhere. Sanctions have backfired. Trade agreements have stalled. Influence has eroded. Washington is running out of options and time. The dollar-denominated financial system has peaked. This is the end of a debt super cycle and of the petrodollar. The next leg down is going to be epic. Powers that be would rather tip the board than lose the game. They'd rather take us to war than take the blame. And if you let them get away with it, that's just the beginning. I said there's a crisis of global governance, but there's not a crisis that's actually impacting the key actors in these countries that, br that brings them to the level of, of creating a common narrative. That create, creates a human narrative. We're not. We're nowhere close to that. Um, and, uh, and and in some areas, maybe we'll develop such a thing. I hope not. I hope it doesn't require that kind of crisis. But the, the, certainly, uh, the, the the crucible of the G20 leads us to believe that that is what's required. Yeah, I, I would agree that. Um, you know, you know what, what, again, 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 I hope it doesn't come to this. But the, you know, the uh, it you know may take an almost existential level crisis in terms of climate change, for instance, or uh, you know, or imagine nuclear use. Right, whether by terrorist group or by, you know, on this Indian subcontinent, that, that would help people get religion very quickly. And I mean, <laughs> different kinds of religions, I guess, but, <laughs> but at least get, get them in a common narrative very quickly, but hopefully. If you want people to hear this message, like it, share it, download it, and spread it. Believe it or not, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Want to see how deep the rabbit hole goes? Subscribe to Storm Clouds Gathering on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. You can sign up for email notifications of new releases on our website, stormcloudsgathering.com.